to today's episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. We'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Takeda Oncology, for their support of Myeloma Crowd Radio. And we'd like to celebrate today because today is our 100th show. Um, over the last three years, I've been privileged to interview myeloma experts on such a wide variety of topics and from investigators all around the world. Uh, I'm thrilled to help share their truly amazing work. And we're very pleased today to have um, some researchers from Germany join us. Our show today, we know that you've heard about monoclonal antibodies, which target a specific protein on the surface of myeloma cells. This is a very unique approach, targeting both a protein on the surface of myeloma cells and at the same time an activation of T cells. And we have with us today Dr. Hose and Dr. Zeckinger from the University of Heidelberg in Germany. So welcome, doctors. So uh, good morning um, to America from Germany. And, uh, of course, it's a very big uh, honor for us that uh, we are with you at your 100th birthday. So um, I uh, would like also to welcome you on behalf of uh, my second-in-command, uh, Anja Seckinger. Hello, also from my side. Um, and myself, and we are uh, very honored to give this uh, uh, talk and this discussion today uh, because we think it's a very important point to discuss and uh, uh, interact also findings in research and to work together, uh, we as uh, clinicians and uh, researchers with uh, our patients to finally get a hold on a cure of uh, myeloma. So, Jenny, thank you for the nice introduction. Oh, well, thank you. Let me introduce you, actually, both before we get started, because we have a lot to talk about. Um, Dr. Dirk Zohos is head of myeloma, Multiple Myeloma Research Laboratory at the University of Heidelberg. He's a practicing physician at the University of Heidelberg in the Department of Hematology, Oncology, and Rheumatology. He was awarded the Young Investigator Award at the International Myeloma Workshop in Paris and was granted the Ludwig Strauss Habilitation Award for Excellence in Research. And uh, I found it most interesting that your doctoral thesis was on the topic of asymptomatic multiple myeloma, um, molecular background of progression, evolution, and prognosis, which I think is one of the most complex topics about myeloma when you're asymptomatic. Um, now, Dr. Anya Zeckinger is depart deputy head of the Multiple Myel Myeloma Research Laboratory at the University of Heidelberg in Germany and practices in the Multiple Myeloma Section and Department of Internal Medicine of Hematology, Oncology, and Rheumatology. She's been significantly involved with myeloma research in Germany as well as overseas and has received awards including the Young Investigator Grant at the International Myeloma Workshop in Paris, Abstract Achievement Award at the 2015 ASH Conference, and the Best Abstract Award in 2016 at the annual meeting of the German, Austrian, and Swiss Associ Association of Hematology and Medical Oncology in Leipzig, Germany. So doctors, welcome to you both. Um, we'll probably just start with a, just a broad overview. So as, um, and I know you can compare and contrast these with the monoclonal antibodies that patients may already be um, aware of, but what are these T cell bispecific antibodies and in general, how do they work? Well, uh, Jenny, thank you again. So this is a very uh, interesting question. So you have to think of these antibodies uh, as something with two arms, which basically couples uh, T cells by binding on a structure which is at the surface of the T cell, which is called CD3, and with another arm on another structure, which is on a myeloma cell, which is called, uh, in this example, BCMA, so it's B cell maturation antigen. So basically the idea is pretty simple. These antibodies have two arms and bring just together myeloma cells and T cells. And now T cells are the most active, let's say, uh, killers in the immune system. So they are very active in destroying tumor cells and immune cells. But usually in myeloma patients, they do not fulfill the work because um, they are hindered. You can somehow compare this to T cells being a kind of a savage dogs, but they have a muscle. Uh, and now the T cells bring the, the myeloma cell and this uh, dog together, and then it bites 
let's say, the burglar, in our example, the myeloma cells. So it activates it, and then the myeloma cells uh, are killed. And uh, so you utilize the most active cell being able to attack myeloma cells, which is actually the T cell, to uh, attack the myeloma cells and destroy them. Mm-hmm. And the difference would be between, because I know patients are familiar with daratumumab and elotuzumab, which are monoclonal antibodies, um, and they activate the immune system in a certain way, but differently than the T cells. Can you explain the difference? Yeah, um, with a monoclonal antibody like daratumumab, this antibody only binds to myeloma cells, uh, and then immune proteins, for example, are activated and uh, produce a hole in the myeloma cell, which is then subsequently killed, or other cells which are less specific from the immune system bind to the cell uh, and um, attack it. Um, T cells are the much more potent uh, variant of this, and the difference is that this T cell bispecific antibody has two binding sites, so the possibility to simultaneously bind the myeloma cell uh, and the T cells and just bring them together, which is the difference in the mechanism of action. In principle, the molecule itself uh, is quite similar. There are some uh, interesting differences uh, we will uh, talk later on, but in principle, the idea behind it is very simple of this just grabbing with one hand myeloma cells and with the other T cell, and this then activates the T cell uh, for killing myeloma cells. That's just a very visual description. We like to picture that in our minds <laughs> of having T cells go after the myeloma cells and be joined. So when you say they're binding, um, you're binding the myeloma cell to the T cell, and then um, how strong is that binding, or how how does that I so thought this would be uh, an interesting question because this is something uh, for Anya, and I will just uh, pass over. Okay. So this is uh, indeed an interesting question, which uh, was actually raised by Dirk because, um, as you might know, he's not only a physician but also a physicist. And, um, well, at one point uh, he asked, so what is uh, the binding strength between a myeloma cell and a T cell? And uh, finally, we applied uh, an interesting method called um, atomic force microscopy, which is able to measure uh, the binding strength between, in this case, a myeloma cell uh, and a T cell at a very sensitive uh, level. And uh, we did so uh, in the presence of the antibody and without. And... Uh, what came out is that in case the antibody is present, the binding between a myeloma cell and the T cell is increased by a factor of about three to four. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, when you look at the data, the units are in picomolar, uh, piconewton, and well, at least for us, uh, this was not really quite uh, familiar because it uh, sounds uh, not that much, and uh, we uh, calculated what this means uh, if you have a myeloma cell, and it's uh, interestingly, it's 200 times the weight of a myeloma cell that is necessary uh, to break uh, the binding between the myeloma cell and the T cell. And, uh, well, when you think of yourself and somebody is uh, tearing at your arm with uh, 200 times your own body weight, uh, this is uh, then pretty much. So it's a quite strong binding uh, that we see between the myeloma cell and the T cell uh, that is uh, caused by the drug. Yeah, very strong binding. Well, let's start talking about these two different arms because you very um, – you explained very well how it goes after two different targets at the same time or um, to do the binding process. So first question is, I know some of these other monoclonal antibodies are going after different targets like CD38 or CS1, and this one is going after BCMA. So first, why BCMA as a target? And then we'll talk about the T-cell arm a little bit. Okay. So uh, BCMA... 
uh, is uh, called B cell maturation antigen, and this basically describes uh, at what time during the development of plasma cells from their early precursors uh, is expressed. So it's very late expressed on plasma cells, and it's expressed on normal plasma cells and also on malignant plasma cells, so myeloma cells. And the very important point is that it's almost exclusively expressed on normal and malignant plasma cells. Now, and this is the reason why we choose it. Now, why is this important? This is important because I gave you the example with this uh, savage dog uh, before, and the yeah. problem is to control this dog. You know, you do not want, uh, in our example, this to attack uh, bystanders or uh, in our patients that the T cells are uh, falsely activated and then cause side effects because other cell types might also. Uh, be bound by uh, this antibody. So this is the important point, how to control the T cells only to attack the myeloma cells. And this is done because BCMA is very specifically expressed on myeloma cells uh, and on uh, normal plasma cells. So the, uh, these are the only cells which are attacked. And this is quite a unique pattern because for other antigens, like you mentioned, uh, CS1 or CD38, the spectrum of cells expressing it, it's much more broad. And therefore, not only uh, the myeloma cells as target cells are killed, uh, but it also causes some of the side effects. So um, it's this pattern of expression limited to myeloma cells and normal plasma cells, but also it's reasonably strong expressed uh, on uh, the myeloma cells. You can easily think that this is important because when you think of this grabbing actually the myeloma cells with the antibody, when there are too, le uh, too few handles on the cell, uh, you might uh, go astray by, your, by trying to grab it, um, which is something which is in place for some uh, of the antibodies or mechanism of resistance we might talk about uh, later on. So this is the basic choice and we uh, screened a high number of uh, potential uh, targets and this was actually from this uh, expression uh, the best uh, target we have uh, we have seen or, or identified. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, the, the arm why it's this specific uh, arm binding to myeloma cells and now for the T cell arm uh, this binds CD3 and this is an antigen which is expressed on almost all T cells, and the, these T cells are uh, bound, just selected uh, as uh, as binding as described before, uh, and brought together to the myeloma cells. Uh, and by this process of bringing the myeloma cell and the T cell together, the T cell is activated, and this activation is like uh, it is also. Uh, being done during a normal immune reaction. So this CD3 uh, is one of the main T cell receptors, so a structure which uh, helps the cell to communicate from the outside to the inside and to mediate this process of the activation. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it's different than, you know, there there are a lot of different targets, protein targets on the surface of cells. And you hear a lot of different targets in myeloma, but it sounds like that CD3 is like the primary target for um, T cells. Is that an accurate way of saying it? Yeah, it's uh, actually you must you can just imagine uh, why I choose CD3 because it's expressed on almost all uh, T cells, and so it's a very uh, good uh, target just to select almost all of the T cells. There are other uh, antigens of T cells like CD4 or CD8, but they are always only expressed in a subfraction. Now, if you want to uh, get more or less all T cells uh, activated, then you have to choose something which is almost on all T cells, and it's as easy as that, that this is the case for CD3. Mm -hmm. So you're enlisting more T-cell help, basically, by going after CD3. So how long does it take for a T-cell to kill a myeloma cell? Well, the killing of a myeloma cell uh, takes about uh, six to eight hours. You can uh, calculate this when you um, just uh, watch in a, a live microscopy and you just can um, see myeloma cells being killed by T-cells and you can... Uh, then just calculate 
uh, the time of uh, how long uh, this takes, and this is about uh, six to eight hours. And then uh, T cells, which are activated like this, are kind of serial killers, so they cannot only kill one myeloma cell, but they are able to kill one myeloma cell after another, and they even proliferate, so they even uh, multiply um, themselves when they are uh, exposed with this antibody. So you amplify the reaction against the myeloma cells. Oh, that's great that it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's just continually expanded. So some more questions about the BCMA target. <clears throat> so um, how would you – I know there are a lot of myeloma cells. You can. I had a researcher talk about how he was testing for BCMA levels, and the BCMA would go up and down, and it would almost correlate with the M spike. And I don't know if that's accurate or not, but he was working on a test to, to look at that. So if there is some BCMA, but not a lot, on normal cells, how do you avoid it binding to normal cells with BCMA versus just myeloma cells with BCMA? Well, the, uh, okay, the only uh, normal cell which um, actually expresses BCMA is a normal plasma cell. And uh, these cells are likewise uh, targeted by uh, the antibodies, so they are also uh, removed. Um, but uh, this can be quite easily coped because what is not removed is the cell type which evolves to this normal plasma cell, so the early stages of the plasma cell differentiation. So basically these cells are also involved when you are vaccinated and generate a new uh, immune response and also when you encounter uh, an antigen, again, which you have previously encountered, like a measles virus or so, uh, and these cells are then able to redifferentiate into plasma cells and to, again, uh, produce the antibodies. So you cannot avoid that also the normal plasma cells are targeted. Mm -hmm. But as I said, this is not critical because they are uh, reproduced, um, again, in the circulation. And this effect of removing normal plasma cells is also something one sees very regularly uh, in uh, myeloma patients because, um, as you know, there is also immune suppression in the myeloma patients. So when they produce, when myeloma cells produce monoclonal antigen, then the normal protective immune globulin level also drops. And once myeloma is successfully treated, they also come back. Uh, to normal levels, and this is exactly the same what we uh, think will happen uh, once the myeloma uh, is treated with uh, hopefully the TCB in this case. Mm -hmm. So your body will regulate it essentially. So now I know that in patients there can be different levels of BCMA expression. So does this present a challenge for this type of treatment? So and why do some patients have more BCMA than others? Um, so this is just a, a biological um, variable. So as there are men and women who are taller or less tall, that's just a physiological. Uh, difference which appears from uh, individual uh, to individual. What you can say is that uh, the level of BCMA expression in the myeloma cells is almost as high as in the uh, normal plasma cells, so there's not a huge amount of variation uh, in between. So and this is just a biological BCMA, thing, just, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. No, go ahead. Okay, uh, but the problem is, uh, the, the point is rather um, whether uh, this, is, uh, this is a problem um, for a treatment because, let's say, those patients who have less high expression on their uh, myeloma cell surface would eventually uh, react less well. Um, but this is not the case because uh, we found that even with very low numbers of uh, BCMA molecules on a myeloma cell, uh, you still have a very good activity of uh, the compound. So just to give you an idea, uh, usually on one myeloma cell, there are several thousands of uh, BCMA molecules, about 2,000 in the, in the median. Um, and uh, we uh, even saw 
uh, killing of myeloma cells when there were only uh, 42, uh, 42 in contrast to several thousand molecules on the surface. So it does not um, pose a clinical problem. Uh, and the reasons for or the reason for this is that the binding of this BCMA grabbing arm uh, is really strong and is therefore able to grab the myeloma cells also when there's uh, not so many uh, of these BCMA antigens on the surface of the cell. Well, that's fantastic that it's not an issue. So that's great. Um, that's great news. So I have a question. Is BCMA uh, expressed in MGAS and smoldering myeloma patients. So I guess at earlier stages of myeloma development or at earlier stages of um, plasma cell or B cell development. Okay, I think Anya will take this question. Yeah, this is again an interesting question also for uh, patients. If you think of maybe treating also uh, patients at uh, earlier stages, and, uh, in fact, we analyzed about 1,000 uh, CD1, uh, CD138 uh, purified uh, plasma cell samples, um, including patients with uh, MGAS, but also smoldering myeloma, uh, symptomatic myeloma, and relapsed myeloma. And we found uh, BCMA to be expressed uh, in all these uh, stages. So there's uh, no... Uh, difference in the BCMA expression between the early stages and uh, the late stages. So it potentially could be used earlier, right? Yes, of if course. approved. This, uh, mm -hmm. this, yeah, that'd be uh, great. Could be an option also for, uh, let's say, high-risk uh, smoldering myeloma patients. Yes, absolutely. Oh, that's great. Well, that kind of brings me into another question about different genetics. Um, as a lot of patients know. Not all myeloma is the same, and every patient will have different genetic features on their myeloma, and some will have higher risk features, and some will have kind of standard risk features. So does this discriminate between myeloma genetics, or probably not, because it's just going after the BCMA, right? It doesn't care if you have a deletion 13 or 17 or a 1114 translocation or anything like that. Yes, this is uh, indeed the case. So we looked again also for this and uh, looked for different uh, risk stratifications, uh, not only cytogenetics, but also uh, gene expression-based uh, risk scores or proliferation and also uh, tumor mass, uh, for example, the ISS stage, or also the revised ISS. And uh, there was, again, no difference uh, in the BCMA expression between uh, let's say, low or standard risk uh, patients and uh, high risk patients. So it's, again, uh, applicable in principle uh, to all patients, irrespective of the risk uh, of the myeloma. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. That's great, because then you don't need a specific or personal personalized version, I guess. So Tell, me, tell us a little bit about what you've studied so far. If, in your study, how did it work for newly diagnosed or relapsed or even heavily pretreated patients? Because it seemed like reading your paper that um, it worked for everybody. Yeah, actually, this is uh, one of the few examples where myeloma is really uh, easy, and this is uh, one of those examples because, indeed, uh, the compound acts um, in newly diagnosed patients, but also in relapsed patients. And uh, in the manuscript, actually, we have also one patient who had uh, several rounds of, uh, of pretreatment who was heavily pretreated. Um, and uh, we would not have uh, suspected uh, that the patient would, uh, patient's myeloma cells would also respond, but this was actually uh, the case, and uh, they were almost cleared from the sample. Uh, and this is a specific surprise because usually we think that uh, there is an immune defect or a suppression of immunity uh, in uh, uh, in our uh, myeloma patients because they are prone to infections and so on. So you would rather think that also the T cells, having seen all this pretreatment and the exposure to uh, anti-myeloma drugs and so on, are not no more that active, but it's not the case. 
Um, and this is, of course, very important because, as in all clinical trials, the first patient to be treated with the compound will be a relapsed patient. So, indeed, that's, uh, that's very or was very good news. And uh, we looked uh, in total for 48 uh, patients, um, and uh, it uh, basically uh, showed activity after 48 hours uh, in over 80% of uh, these uh, these patients, um, where you find a very significant reduction in, in some of the samples, uh, all myeloma cells uh, were killed in this for myeloma relatively short amount of time. So uh, we are uh, thinking that uh, indeed it will work throughout the stages, uh, as Anya had put for the genetics also uh, within the patients who are uh, relapsing and also. Uh, patients at uh, a situation where the treatment options might be very limited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that brings up a couple questions. So I know I've heard other doctors talk about T cell exhaustion and where the T cells just get overworked and then they get tired. Maybe that's why the myeloma cells grow out of control in the first place. But does this ever happen with the CD3? Um, T cell, or have you seen any of that, or or is that totally irrelevant? Is this kind of a dumb question, <laughs> which it could be? <laughs> no, I would not. Uh, I would not say because mm-hmm. this is what uh, we were also confronted uh, when we uh, presented the data at the ASH meeting, for example. Uh, because this T cell exhaustion is, of course, one of the things you are more or less afraid of. Uh, when you give uh, T-cell by specific antibodies, but there was no indication um, that the cells could not be killed. And our explanation for us is, uh, if you can uh, think of this uh, dog example, that these uh, energic or uh, less active uh, T-cells are a little bit like dogs uh, who are um, prevented from biting by uh, having this uh, muzzle uh, on their nose, um, and it really seems that uh, this antibody by bringing the cells together allows uh, this to be removed and uh, T cells being again active. And the evidence for this is given that um, many of the patients were heavily pretreated. Uh, so it's not at all a dumb question, but it seems that uh, the antibody is uh, clever enough to uh, move away the muzzle um, from uh, from our uh, T cells and they are again able to attack the myeloma cells. Mhm. Okay, that's good. Wow, that's good news. In, now, in your paper, you mentioned that a certain number of my, uh, like particular number of myeloma cells, can be killed at one time by the CD3 T cell. So, if there's a high t- tumor burden or val- very fast growing cells, what does this mean for patients who have a really heavy load of myeloma? Mhm. Does it have an that does is, it have any variety of impact? Ah, this is an interesting question. Also, um, I mean, uh, you have to take into account what fast growing means, um, and you have to answer this question to set into perspective the doubling time uh, of a myeloma cell, which is usually uh, not below uh, several weeks, uh, and the time for killing of one myeloma cell, which is uh, around this uh, six to eight hours. So uh, even if myeloma um, grows fast, then still the killing of the myeloma cells is uh, pretty much faster by a high uh, amount, uh, let's say 10 or 100 times faster uh, compared to how long myeloma cells take um, to um, to multiply, to to uh, divide and uh, proliferate. And uh, this means that it should also work in patients who have a quite high tumor load and the aggressive myeloma because even then uh, the doubling time or the, the time in which the myeloma proliferates is um, quite lower. Uh, we had seen, however, uh, in our paper in an animal model, in a mouse uh, carrying uh, a myeloma that um, in three of six animals there was no uh, activity. Uh, Three of uh, nine animals there was no uh, activity or only a minor activity. But in this experiment there was used a myeloma cell line uh, which had a, a very much higher proliferation or accumulation rate. So in this only in this setting 
uh, of uh, of a mouse we were uh, not able to see uh, some of the uh, myelomas being uh, removed and uh, this again is uh, the the rate of how the cell lines proliferate is much higher uh, so we don't see that this might be a problem uh, in the uh, in the myeloma patients because we also saw when you look at the number of T cells which are in our specific uh, sample that this can be quite low uh, compared to the number of myeloma cells. Uh, so to to summarize this, uh, from what we know yet, uh, this should not be a problem. Mm -hmm. That's great news. So now on, um, I know that there have been some articles come out recently about daratumumab that sometimes when patients start getting treated by daratumumab, their cells will start losing the CD38 signature on the surface, and so then daratumumab has nothing to go after. <clears throat> Can patients lose this BCMA signature also, or or is that kind of escape unlikely? Well, um, this is a very good question. Basically, there have been um, publications several years ago showing that there are no viable plasma cells without uh, BCMA. So if you remove it uh, in an experiment, then also the plasma cells die. This prompts us to think that it is a very good target because one should think that the myeloma cells cannot downregulate it or completely cut it off so that the grabbing uh, of the TCB uh, goes into uh, into void. Uh, but of course, this is something which in the end has to be uh, tested within the clinical trials because myeloma cells are, of course, um, quite clever when, they, when it comes to avoiding uh, strategies, and this might eventually later on prompt not to use the compound as a single uh, compound, but also in combination with other uh, compounds where we might discuss on later on. So is there evidence that myeloma cells could lose uh, a BCMA in our experiments or for what is known in literature? No, but you can, of course, not exclude it uh, until you have really tested the compound within a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about how how you use it in the clinic or how you've used it in the clinical trial. So how is it administered? Is it it's an infusion? And then how how often and what kind of schedule would you be using? Those types of things. Yeah, so um we have uh, tested it um in the animals giving it uh, IV or subcutaneously. Um basically it has a quite a uh, long half-life time in the animals of about four uh, days and presumably uh, longer in, the, um, in humans because in animals it's always uh, shorter than in humans for uh, this kind of uh, antibodies or TCBs. So the idea would be to give it once or twice a week either uh, IV or as either in the, in the vein or uh, subcutaneously. So it would be okay. more or less mm -hmm. compa uh, comparable from the schedule to uh, antibodies like doratumumab are, uh, are given, um, but the exact uh, way of how it is dosed and uh, how often it is given to you to lead to the maximum uh, effect and treatment uh, would, of course, have to be determined within the clinical trials in the phase one uh, clinical trial. But this is the, the idea, at least this is the treatment schedule we used um, in the animal experiments uh, to that end. Mm -hmm. And then how um, how often, I guess you'd have to test that in a clinical trial too, but what would your initial guess be if you had to say how often is administered? Is it something like Dertumumab where you get the first infusion, it's kind of longer, and then you know you get it repeatedly, but it kind of spaces out over time? Or um, I guess you would just have to see, right? Uh, you cannot really uh, answer this because you have, of course, to balance uh, there the convenience to the patient. This is the main reason why you uh, decrease the daratumumab over time because you think that you come into a saturation, so you cannot get too much higher when you add another 
uh, round every week or every two weeks, uh, and then it's also convenience uh, for the patients. And for this, it's uh, really too early uh, to answer. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But right. as said, the initial schedule will uh, most likely be uh, twice a week. But then everything uh, has to come from uh, how it really uh, works out and uh, also from how the pharmacokinetics are in the patient. So meaning uh, how long the compound is uh, stable in the patient, how fast it is excreted and so on. But uh, most likely we will start with uh, twice weekly administration. Oh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about side effects or toxicity, infusion reactions, that kind of thing. I know with the CAR T cell um, work on BCMA, and that's probably the most well known BCMA type, type of target in myeloma, is that it has a cytokine release. So, can you, in, in reading your paper, it sounded like this approach had a really low toxicity profile. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, uh, also from the additional data we have obtained up to now, uh, you uh, see no severe toxicity or you see no toxicity in terms of uh, organ toxicity or anything like this. And the only thing uh, you actually see is some mild cytokine release um, in uh, the monkeys, which is not surprising because you more or less cannot activate T cells without some cytokine release, uh, but it's clinically... Uh, very, um, uh, or it doesn't uh, in the animals doesn't uh, uh, hinder them in uh, in any way. Uh, of course, this is something you have to look at in the clinical trials. But um, we, of course, know how to administer antibodies because they are used for uh, quite some time. So I would say that this is not uh, not uh, really a problem. Uh, and definitely not something which would be more of a problem compared to other antibodies like daratumumab. Um, so the really good thing is, as we see it now, uh, is there's a very favorable toxicity profile for the drug, um, which also connects to a question you had um, early on whether this might, uh, and Anya nicely answered that, uh, whether to treat patients also with, uh, let's say, asymptomatic myeloma, um, that, of course, if it really um, will have this toxicity profile, this would be, of course, another argument to rather treat the patients early. But again, uh, in the end, you only know uh, when you um, uh, conduct the clinical trial. So uh, we have high hopes that it's uh, not toxic, um, but we have to, to see uh, in the patient, at least, however, from the preclinical data in the animals, uh, there's uh, nothing which prompts us to assume that uh, there's uh, some uh, some toxicity or strong toxicity. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. So um, why don't you outline when you see this coming to a phase one clinical trial? How how does that work in your regulatory process, and and when do you estimate that that would, might happen? Well, actually, there's a quite uh, set uh, schedule to bring uh, compound uh, TCB compound uh, anti BCMA uh, into uh, the clinic, and this is scheduled for the first quarter of 2018. So this is uh, okay. really uh, quite uh, quite fast. You know, it always takes some time to develop a compound and then uh, to do all the regulatory things. So this is. Uh, presumably uh, done, or it it will be done, actually, I know, because I'm uh, part of this, of course, uh, within the year, and so that we will be able to start, uh, hopefully, in the first quarter of 2018 with the enrollment of the first patient. And how many patients will you have in that first trial? This will be obviously a phase one trial, right? This still has uh, the process of being... Uh, determined with the authorities which are involved quite early because it's uh, also a novel type of treatment and we would like to go for uh, innovative strategy in performing this trial. Uh, Usually the number of patients is anything between uh, 20 and 80 and this has to be determined in in detail. So 
uh, we do not uh, yet know because this is still something in the process of discussing. But it's not, clearly not not uh, in a large trial, uh, uh, in including several hundred of patients, but rather to this number. Mm -hmm. And I know in early phase one clinical trials, you're not really thinking, of, you're just thinking, does this, um, you know, you're trying to assess dose and safety and things like that. And then a phase two trial, you'll you'll look at how effective it is. And once you get to phase three trials and beyond, then you start thinking about to combine it with other therapies. But in general, as, as a myeloma expert and team of experts, um, you've been working on myeloma for a long time, and typically myeloma therapies are combined. So could you see this being combined with other myeloma therapies? Um, which ones, and how would you see that happening? I think this is the several million dollar question um, <laughs> to answer, uh, yeah. also because all the compounds are quite costly. But um, besides that, I think uh, we will have to determine what the efficacy of the compound really is in the uh, phase uh, one, two trial, which will be a combined phase one, two trial. Uh, but then clearly uh, you would think of combining it uh, with uh, compounds which stimulate the immune system like lenalidomide would be an obvious choice uh, and mm -hmm. also it would be an obvious choice to use uh, daratumumab which attacks as we have discussed initially. Oh, I think we... Okay, well, we lost our doctor but uh, they have directions to call back in so we will... We will do that and uh, wait for them to call back in on the line. Sometimes, and they're calling in from Germany, so this, this happens on occasion, but we're not finished with our questions yet. So we will be watching for them. So they're back online. Okay. Hang on a second. Okay, sorry, we hmm. lost you for a minute. So go ahead, and you were answering that question about um, if combining with myeloma therapy. So s apologize for the system dropping you. I... No, so obviously We're... I shouldn't have made the joke about uh, the myeloma <laughs> uh, treatment cost. Uh, don't know whether there is some, some connection. I presumably, of course, not. Um, no, the combination <laughs> uh, we were... Uh, we were, uh, you know, there are all kinds of conspiracy theories, but I think we can exclude this here. No, uh, so come back to the topic. Uh, I think um, there are some natural combinations, and one would be lenalidomide, uh, something stimulating the immune system uh, would, of course, make sense, and also uh, it would be an idea to uh, test the compound together with the daratumumab, for example, because the two uh, compounds have both um, quite good uh, uh, toxicity profile, and they attack the myeloma cells from different directions. Um, and obviously you would think uh, also of combining it with something like uh, dexamethasone, and this uh, again has to be determined, but in the end we would also uh, think that most likely uh, it will be part of a combination therapy, which then again it would be uh, if the hope uh, holds true that it's really uh, having a good efficacy but a, a low toxicity, then it would be a very good uh, combination partner. But again, okay, yeah, well, uh, you never know until you have tried. Right. And maybe the system just knew how much patients hate dexamethasone <laughs> and dropped the line when you said it. I don't know. I think the idea of um, daratumumab or other immunotherapies would be so exciting. And I know that dexamethasone impacts the immune system, kind of suppresses it. So that would be interesting to see a drug like lenalidomide or daratumumab or this all, you know, combined as a triplet or something. That would be really fascinating to see how that affects the immune system. This is indeed a, a very a very interesting question. And there's also the discussion also, uh, within panels of myeloma expert, where, whether it might be a good idea to add um, dexamethasone to uh, or antibody treatment, um, and also, of course, specifically to 
certain things like uh, T-cell bispecific antibodies and there are two effects which go uh, in different directions. Uh, the one is that dexamethasone is one of the most active um, agents in killing uh, myeloma cells. Uh, and the other is that you are always, of course, afraid that you hinder especially T-cell function. And which of the two would... Uh, be uh, more important, again, would have to be determined uh, in a clinical trial. I would rather put my money uh, on the dexamethasone, but as I do not have to take it, I can easily say uh, <laughs> say this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, again, again, uh, you, uh, again, you uh, would just have to determine it because there's no way to do this up front without uh, really seeing right. how it works out in the well, completely. So one thing that I think is really interesting about this is that in a lot of the other immunotherapy approaches that are coming out right now, they're more personalized. So let's say the CAR T cell, you know, you're you're modifying a particular patient's T cells. Is this more of an off-the-shelf approach that patients could get similar to, you know, an off-the-shelf drug that we have right now in myeloma? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just uh, like uh, from the way you give it, uh, let's say like uh, daratumumab or uh, things like lenalidomide, um, they do not, uh, it's not uh, in any way patient uh, specific, right. which mm -hmm. is a good point because, uh, and this is also why we put so much work in checking that it's really expressed on all the different, uh, we had the genetics of myeloma and all the different stages and so on. Um, so uh, this we have shown and so it's uh, really or is foreseen really to be an off-the-shelf uh, medication. Right. Can you compare and contrast, I guess, with other um, immunology or immunological type of approaches? Um, like I've heard a little bit about the bite technology, and then I, you know, we are actually funding a CAR T cell technology project. So I'm quite familiar, and I know a lot of people are more familiar with that. I know the bite is kind of newer, but maybe you could kind of put these things in perspective for us. I think uh, the main advantage uh, over the bite uh, technology is that uh, with our antibody we have an uh, extended elimination half-life, so allowing, as Dirk has pointed out, already a convenient uh, dosing schedule uh, for the bites. Uh, in contrast, you usually uh, require uh, it usually requires a continuous uh, infusion via a pump uh, that uh, is carried by the patients for weeks and which at least um, to me is, is uh, maybe not that uh, convenient. So this is, uh, I would say, the main advantage uh, over the, the bite uh, technology. Um, mm -hmm. Compared to, to CAR T cells, I think, uh, well, as you have already mentioned, uh, for CAR T cells, you need a, a, pa a patient-specific generation, uh, which is uh, costly, uh, and uh, EM801 is, uh, as we have already uh, heard about, uh, in principle applicable to uh, all patients, and furthermore, uh, the TCB uh, antibody is, uh, of course, uh, eliminated from uh, circulation within maybe around one to two months uh, compared to a described long-term persistence of uh, engineered T-cells in a case of CAR T-cell uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so fascinating. I'm really thrilled that you are working on this. It's such an exciting opportunity, I think, and I think it's really genius that you, you have come up with us and are working on it. So um, I want to open it up just for caller questions. If anyone has a question, they can dial 347-637-2631 and then press 1 on your keypad, and um, we'll have a caller question at 310-5598 first. Go ahead with your question. Hello? Hello. Go ahead. Doctor, thank yes. you for joining our show. Um, your work is happening in Germany. 
I have a quick question. Um, could U.S. patients join a phase one clinical trial if they wanted to? I'm sorry, I think Go. I didn't I think, uh, I th hear it correctly. I think the question, yeah, the question is um, if you are running a clinical trial in Germany and a U.S. patient wants to join, is that possible? Well, this is principle possible, but uh, we will not only run the trial uh, in Germany, but there will also be uh, likely one site in the U.S. Uh, being opened. Uh, in principle, that would be possible, but of course, uh, it would have to be negotiated with the respective uh, insurance uh, from the American side, from our side. Uh, it would not be uh, a problem. Um, and uh, the plan is, uh, and we also should mention this, that it's an initiative which is uh, run not only by us, but also initially from the uh, colleagues uh, from uh, Engmap, so the initial company producing it, and it will be also uh, be opened uh, in one site uh, in Spain together with uh, Bruno Paiva and uh, Jesus San Miguel, who is the head of the group there. So it will be planned to be at uh, three sites. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, we also look for, or we also have uh, had this in mind when. Uh, when choosing the site, so they will be very likely also open the site in the U.S. So you don't have to uh, come to uh, Germany for for being recruited for the trial. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks for your question. So let me ask you some more questions about Engmab. Um, the so would the clinical trial be a pharma-sponsored clinical trial, which would be open in multiple sites, like you're saying, in Germany and Spain, and then sites in the United States? Or is this, um, or, or how does that work? And, and maybe you want to share a little more about that company as well. Okay. Uh, so this is also uh, an interesting question. This company has uh, started uh, as a three-people company uh, by uh, uh, Klaus Strein and uh, Professor Klaus Strein and uh, Dr. Diem uh, Min Wu and just uh, one investor from uh, Switzerland, uh, Erich Hunzinger. Um, and um, then uh, they developed uh, the antibody together with us and as I mentioned also with the clinic uh, from um, Professor Jesus San Miguel from Pamplona in Spain and uh, Bruno Paiva. Um, and then uh, we presented uh, the data, or actually Anya presented uh, the data at uh, the ASH meeting in 2015. Uh, and then later on, something really, uh, well, strange and, uh, and funny happened because then the company was bought by uh, Celgene for actually a huge amount of money, so for 600 million uh, euros. Wow. Uh, which is uh, yeah. more or less the same than than uh, US dollars. But before you ask, we did uh, did not get anything uh, for this, so we still have to continue uh, working, which we would anyway uh, do. But then it was uh, acquired by Celgen actually, um, and the trial will be uh, sponsored and uh, run by Celgen. But of course, we and also the initial Ingmap team uh, and also the group of uh, Pamplona will be. Uh, involved on this, and for the uh, phase one two trial, the plan at the moment uh, is to have uh, one or two sites uh, at the respective countries, but also to uh, start the trial uh, obviously uh, in the United States. So it's really a quite uh, quite uh, interesting uh, story, almost of course for those who initially started it a bit like a fairy tale. Uh, but it explains also why we are uh, really proud uh, to be part of this and really looking forward to uh, see the patient, the first patient treated. Because, you know, this is our ultimate uh, motivation, treating patients and seeing that at some time you might end in a situation which is very difficult for the patient because you do not have any more uh, treatment options. And then on the other hand, of course, always this kind of research can be really frustrating when you try to uh, develop uh, compounds or work in this and then uh, at one or other stage it does not work out. But in this case, uh, we are really uh, pleased and happy that uh, we will uh, indeed bring it together with the colleagues to uh, the clinical trial. 
Mm-hmm. Well, to me, this is a, a great success story. I interviewed Dr. Craig Cruz, you know, the inventor of carfilzomib, and he talked mm-hmm. about this valley of death period that happens between that initial development that you talked about with, you know, three people person company, and um, it's a challenge because you need the funding in order to get the research results in order to look exciting enough to be pursued and this sounds like a terrific opportunity and one that was um picked up very quite successfully so that is terrific that you will have the the resources that you need to continue to run these clinical trials and take it all the way through the process it's very exciting one thing i want to mention is um that this show was founded on the the importance of joining clinical trials And um, products like this or or research like this that's happening is really moving the bar in myeloma therapy and helping you as researchers come to better conclusions more quickly. So I would just encourage patients um, to be aware of trials like these, and we will continue to follow your progress and post on on this um, topic when the clinical trial opens so that patients are aware of it and can join it. But it's really critical for patients to think about joining a clinical trial, um, whether they need treatment right now or not. I, In my opinion, you really need to plan ahead and be aware of things like this that are happening in the world of myeloma so that if you need to make a decision on your treatment, you can put yourself in a position to join a clinical trial like this. Oh, I think I could not agree more uh, to this because uh, you have to be aware that everything we know now about myeloma and also which drugs work and which actually don't uh, is based on uh, former patients uh, being included in clinical trial uh, and being uh, willing to uh, help in this, even if several of these patients did not actually by themselves profit from eventually the treatment there. Uh, but only by this uh, joint effort, as I mentioned initially, between physicians and also patients. And this, as you mentioned, uh, makes it very uh, important for patients uh, to consider uh, being part of a clinical trial. So only with this, we will eventually be able uh, to cure myeloma uh, at uh, one time. And uh, you might also uh, want to stress that there are, of course, very different types of clinical trials. So some trials uh, where uh, the medication is uh, almost uh, approved or which are at a very late stage. So several hundreds or even thousands of patients have already been treated. Uh, and then uh, in contrast, those trials where it's really, as we have talked today, uh, something which is the first use of a drug um, in men. And of course, one has to stress to uh, discuss with your treating physician as a patient uh, what might be the options and then to think about it. But the important thing, uh, and in this, again, we could not agree more, it's important to think about uh, whether to participate uh, in a clinical trial. Um, and this is really absolutely important. And uh, to this end, we, of course, also thank uh, all our patients who are willing to Uh, undergo the extra effort, you know, always you have to come uh, some extra Mm -hmm. times to the center where the trial is performed. And uh, we really appreciate also the effort of all our patients to be willing uh, to undergo this eventually to have uh, for a scientific question then another bone marrow aspiration, which, of course, we also know uh, as, uh, as volunteers for this, uh, to be quite a painful uh, procedure, but we really appreciate it. And I think if we will be able to cure myeloma, we will only be this uh, as a joint team between physicians, researchers, and patients. Mm-hmm. Well, I believe it is um, mutually beneficial. I think it's wonderful when patients decide to do that. Um, I think they should always do that with their own care in mind. But um, uh, we've I've seen research that shows that patients who join clinical trials actually do better too, with um, their overall survival. So I think, um, and maybe that's because they're followed so carefully. It is extra work and extra effort, but you really do benefit from it. 
Well, Dr. Hosen and Dr. Zeckinger, I am so appreciative that you joined us today. Um, what an amazing topic and what exciting research. I'm just thrilled that you're working on it. And I can't wait to see what happens in um, early 2018 with this study. Really, really pleased. And thank you so much for joining us today. So uh, thank you also for this uh, opportunity uh, to discuss about it and also for your uh, effort uh, to uh, really bring this to the patient. And I think uh, shows like this bring together um, patients and uh, U.S. Uh, organization and also us as clinicians and researchers. It's a wonderful thing to indeed have a, have a discussion and spread. So we uh, thank you and uh, we'll begin our evening while you uh, are <laughs> only in the middle of your morning, uh, perhaps for the uh, post-show uh, coffee eventually, at least this would be what we would do. And so we wish you a very good day uh, and all the best from Germany. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to Myeloma Crowd Radio. Tune in next time to learn more about the latest in myeloma research and what it means for you. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.